Well, good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be part of this meeting and to talk to you a little bit about uh, contemplative neuroscience, which is an emerging field within neuroscience that interests itself with uh, merging contemplative practices with uh, scientific methods of inquiry. So I'm going to give you just a brief overview of what this field has been about for the past 10 or 12 years of its existence. And I will go into this in much more detail next week at the meeting with um, uh, the Geishes and the monastic graduates as part of the uh, workshop. So please consider this a very simple, broad overview. And if you have more detailed questions, there will be more days to go in depth with them for those of you who are still there next week. So as you probably know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been really interested in, uh, in science and also in dialogues between scientists and contemplatives. And it was really his idea uh, at one of the Mind and Life meetings uh, almost 14 years ago to um, ask neuroscientists if they could investigate what these meditation practices actually do to the brain. And here you can see a picture where he's talking with uh, Professor Richie Davidson, who was one of the scientists there at this meeting. And together, they really started designing uh, a first series of experiments in which they would record brain activity in uh, highly expert meditators, uh, some Tibetan monks, uh, and see see what happens in the brain. So it was very much, at that stage, an exploration uh, that was not necessarily a theory or uh, any pre-existing uh, hypothesis about what might happen. So this was really a very first uh, stage in the scientific study of meditation. So you can see here some pictures of monks uh, being uh, participants in these studies, uh, the one on the left uh, with an EEG device, electroencephalogram, and the one on the right in an MRI scanner. And I'll talk a little bit about these two uh, methods and what uh, these early studies have found. So, uh, but first of all, I just want to uh, give a little bit of a motivation of why do we want to do brain imaging uh, to study uh, the effects of meditation scientifically. Why the brain? Uh, because potentially the whole body is involved. And indeed, I myself am very interested in my research on the effects of meditation training on not just the brain, but other systems in the body. But the brain is really the first place we think of looking at because it is the place that um, where everything that happens in the body is coordinated and controlled. So, uh, and that's just not just our conscious thoughts or not just what we would call mind, but every phenomenon happening in the body, uh, be it the immune system, digestion, like all of these uh, uh, phenomena are in some way regulated by the brain. Um, and so the question is, in meditation practice, which parts of the brain are involved, become more active, less active? Do they change size or shape after many years of practice? Um, and uh, can we quantify that? Can we measure these things uh, scientifically? So one early study uh, from the field uh, that was uh, published eight years ago just looked at brain anatomy of people with many years of experience practicing meditation every day and comparing them with people who were not meditation practitioners. And that study, uh, conducted by a colleague of mine, Sarah Lazar, found some interesting differences between the brains of meditation practitioners and non-practitioners. In particular, it seemed as if uh, people who did have a regular meditation practice have less of the effects of aging on the brain in the form of uh, cortical thinning. So basically, 
layers on top of the brain uh, uh, called the cortex become thinner and thinner as people age. But it seemed like in meditators instead, um, the thinning didn't really happen. So meditators who were in their 40s or 50s had similar cortical thickness as people who were still in their 20s and 30s. So that was very intriguing. And in particular, because they found this in two specific brain regions that people have previously associated with emotions and uh, sensory processing. So it raised the question of how, how could it be that people who practiced meditation a lot would have this difference in the brain as they age. And so uh, the answer to that, as I hope many of you know by now, uh, is in this concept of neuroplasticity, which is basically the idea that uh, with practice, and really any kind of practice, anything we learn to do, or any facts that we learn, the brain itself changes in ways that are measurable uh, in the brain anatomy. And um, so this concept, which was quite revolutionary within neuroscience when uh, it became clear that this was still going on even in adults, not just in young children, but throughout the whole life, that the brain would continually change as we learn new things and as we practice new things, was really at the core of, uh, of this field of contemplative neuroscience. And so, again, the question was, uh, how does that work? If you practice meditation, that changes the brain. How and can we uh, study that scientifically? So, um, so I'm going to talk about one of the first studies that came out after these meetings with His Holiness the Dalai Lama that were conducted by Richie Davidson, you can see here on the picture, uh, with the help of Antoine Lutz, who is another scientist working with Richie. And then you see in the middle, uh, Venerable Mathieu Ricard, who's a, a monk from Shichen Monastery, who has been uh, very involved with these experiments as well, because he was a trained scientist, a molecular biologist in France, and then quit science and became a Tibetan monk. So he really knows both sides of this like nobody else, and so was a, an essential instrument in these uh, collaborations. So one of the first things that they found was uh, when you put a monk like Mathieu Ricard or another practitioner uh, inside an EEG device, like the one pictured here, and asked them to enter a meditative state called non-referential compassion, that there would be uh, strong increases in certain types of brain waves as measured by the EEG, in this case, uh, gamma oscillations in the frontal electrodes. And you can see on this graph that as soon as the practitioner starts practicing this non-referential compassion, there's a strong increase in gamma power in the EEG. So that was very striking because the strength of this effect was many times greater than anything that had been seen in other experiments asking people to do different things. And in fact, it was so strong that it looked as if the person was having a seizure which obviously he was not. So scientists were really uh, strict, uh, struck by this, but still the question remained, what does this mean? Just because we see this effect and it's repeatable and it's strong, uh, that raised more questions than answers because that by itself didn't really tell us what was going on inside the brain. So they did uh, another study, this time using a different uh, method, uh, functional MRI. And you see here uh, Mathieu Ricard sitting outside the scanner. And uh, in this case, again, uh, the monks were asked to enter a state of non-referential compassion. But while they were doing that, they were wearing headphones and some sounds were being played for them. And the question was, how did the brain react to these sounds? and they used two different types of sounds. 
One of a woman screaming in fear, and that was a sound that was supposed to be uh, thinking of someone suffering. And the other sound was a baby cooing, which was supposed to be just a sound of happiness. And so the way it worked is that they would play these sounds repeatedly in random order while the person were listening uh, to them in the headphones. And um, so here's what they found. Uh, they tested expert practitioners, monks, and they also tested novices, people who were not familiar with this practice. And they found two different things. First of all, during the sounds of the person in distress, the woman screaming, there was a faster heartbeat in the expert practitioners, as if they became more aroused by hearing this person suffering uh, in their heart. And correspondingly, there was a stronger response in one particular region of the brain called the insula. And the insula uh, is involved in many different processes, so it's still uh, unclear exactly uh, what that meant, but one hypothesis that came out of this was that this was related to empathy, because uh, in other experiments, the insula has been shown to become more activated when people experience empathy for someone else's pain. So they thought that in this case what happened is that when the practitioners would enter this state of non-referential compassion, they would have stronger activity in the insula, uh, which seemed in line with an increase in empathy for this suffering. And another thing that they found was in a different brain region called the uh, amygdala, also more activation in the expert meditators than in novices when listening to these sounds and when being in a state of non-referential compassion. And finally, they also found increased activation in another brain region, uh, the premotor area, associated with preparing for action. And uh, what that suggested is that this increase in compassion during that state of non-referential compassion also increases the practitioner's willingness to do something and preparing to act to relieve the suffering from the person that's suffering. <laughs> So, um, so these experiments were uh, a first attempt to see effects of meditation on the brain in people who had been doing it for many years and had many, many hours of practice. But um, at that point, it was still unclear from a scientific perspective whether uh, it's, it was because of their training that these practitioners had a different brain response or whether they had always been like this, uh, maybe because of the culture they were raised in, maybe because of genetic predisposition. So that itself did not prove that it was the training itself that actually caused these changes in the brain. So uh, the next question was, can we study these changes when we start with people with no meditation experience and then train them in meditation, and then test again how the brain reacts, and is there a change after this training? So that would be a more uh, valid uh, scientific way to investigate the effects of the training itself, 
is to really follow people through the training and see how they change from before they train to after. And another question uh, that was of interest is how long does it take before we see these effects? Does it really take a lifelong practice with eight hours, 10 hours a day, or can we see changes faster than that? And um, somebody was uh, asking how about after only eight weeks? And why eight weeks? Uh, because uh, other types of interventions, uh, of trainings, of uh, uh, psychotherapy or uh, medical, like medicine, drugs for the brain seem to act in that time window. It's how long it takes to see the beginning of neuroplasticity effects. So people were like, why, why don't we study that with meditation? See if after eight weeks of practice meditation, are there changes in the brain already? So, um, so then we go back to this, um, this training called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, which was created in the 70s and 80s in the United States by John kabat -Zinn. And this was an eight week long course for everyday people that was aimed for stress reduction, but that was really mostly a training in uh, Buddhist inspired practices, and in particular, uh, Vipassana practice from the Theravadan tradition. And uh, with this type of training, scientists had found some beneficial effects on health, uh, a reduction in stress, a reduction in pain, like physical pain, uh, improved immune responses, and so on. So there were all of these beneficial effects in the body, and uh, people were wondering, well, can we see some of these effects also in the brain? Because as I mentioned earlier, the brain is involved with all of these mechanisms and processes. So maybe we can see it there also. So um, during this MBSR training, what people do is uh, several different practices, but mostly uh, they meet for two hours a week with a group, with a teacher who's an MBSR instructor, uh, not a Lama, but someone who has done MBSR training and has a little bit of experience, not a lot. And um, they learn how to do sitting meditation, uh, focused attention, uh, open awareness practices, as in the Theravadan tradition, but also with some elements that John Kabat-Zinn drew from other Buddhist traditions like Zen and even Dzogchen and Mahamudra. And they also do a lot of a practice called the body scan, which is uh, something that John Kabat-Zinn invented, because I don't think it's really traditional per se, but it's essentially cultivating mindfulness of the body while lying down and moving attention to different parts of the body. Um, so uh, people would do that for two hours a week with a group. And then they were also asked to practice at home every day for 45 to 60 minutes using recordings that remind them of the instructions on how to do these practices. And then at the end of the eight-week training, they would do a one-day-long silent meditation retreat. So this format is really standard now. There's also multiple variations on this. It's a program that's very popular in the US. And so there's been a lot of efforts in trying to investigate what it does to health and then now also to the brain. So, um, um, for example, a colleague of mine, uh, Britta Holzel, also working with Sarah Lazar, just a few years ago uh, found in a study of MBSR that after only eight weeks of this training, already we can see changes in brain anatomy, which was really fascinating because that was um, sooner than some people would say it would take. And uh, in this case, she found increases in uh, gray matter density in the hippocampus, a region involved with learning and memory, but also with stress. Uh, it's one of these regions that actually tends to grow when a person or an animal is under a lot of chronic stress, and then to shrink back when the person uh, actually um, gets better. And um, she also found 
uh, changes in the amygdala, and uh, if you remember, the amygdala was also involved in the findings from Richie Davidson. And in this case, she found a de decrease in size or like in brain um, gray matter density in the amygdala. And that was correlated with the people's reported decreases in stress. So the more a person said, I have a lot of decreased stress now that I've done MBSR, the more of an effect was found in their brain in terms of a reduction in gray matter density in the amygdala. Um, so, um, so these are all uh, interesting uh, practices, uh, the ones from MBSR, but another question that has become of interest in the field is uh, other practices such as uh, practices from the mind training tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, Lojong, especially practices to cultivate loving kindness and compassion. And uh, what are the effects of those on the brain? Are they the same or different from the effects of shamatha or shine practice or this mindfulness training from a BSR? So this question is one that I am myself very interested in. And so I'm going to tell you about uh, a study, a very recent study that I've been working on with uh, these three collaborators, Dr. Chuck Rizon from Arizona, uh, Geshe Lobsang Tenzin Negi, who some of you probably know from the Emory Tibet Science Initiative, uh, who works in Atlanta, and also uh, Thaddeus Space at Emory University. And there's other, many other collaborators. It's a, quite a, a big study. Uh, and in, in this study, we're trying to see if there's any different effects between training in focused attention meditation, or shine, versus training in uh, loving kindness and compassion practices inspired from Lojong tradition. So uh, this study is all on uh, healthy people aged 25 to 55 years old uh, who have no previous experience with meditation. And similar to MBSR, uh, this is an eight-week training in which they meet for two hours a week with a group. But in this study, people are randomized. They don't have a choice. They are assigned by chance to one of three groups. Either they're going to practice compassion meditation from Lo Zhong, or they're going to practice Shine or they're in another group who doesn't do any meditation, but who also meets every week and talks about health and how to improve their health. And that is an intervention specifically designed to control for other beneficial effects that people get just from meeting as a group with experts and learning things that they think are good for their health. But they don't do meditation, so that is a comparison group. And uh, people are asked to meditate every day at home uh, for 20 to 30 minutes in whatever method that they've learned based on which group they're in. But unlike MBSR, there's no other types of practice, uh, no physical yoga or anything else. So the, the shamatha or the shine uh, training that's part of this study was designed by Alan Wallace, who I believe some of you may also know. And it basically goes through um, the um, a standard type of training that uh, Alan Wallace developed, but that is secular. So there's no Buddhist views that are part of this. It's taught in a way that's uh, non-Buddhist uh, non or non-religious. Um, and basically, people will first learn to practice focused attention on the breath, and then for, you know, to improve the quality of their attention such that they also have relaxation, uh, stability, and later on, vividness of their concentration. Um, then, uh, so they do that for focusing on the breath, then they do that for focusing on the contents of the mind, of like thoughts as they come and go. And then uh, finally, they do, um, hopefully at the end of eight weeks, uh, shamatha without an object, a practice also known as uh, awareness of awareness. So it's understood that eight weeks is not a long enough time to really master these practices, but it's more of a way to give them a little um, 
preview or a sense of what it would be like if they were to continue practicing this for much longer. In the compassion meditation group instead, um, uh, this program was designed by Geshe Lubsang uh, based on Lujong and same, same thing, it was made secular. So it's not Buddhist, there's no mention of Buddha, of the Dharma or anything that could be seen as religious. But it's the same essential uh, idea uh, that people will train uh, when they do Lojong practices. So here first they start by cultivating uh, focused attention, stability of mind as they did in the group that does Shine, because that's necessary before they can start really cultivating any other uh, mind state. And then uh, they uh, practice uh, mindfulness of sensations, feelings and emotions with the idea that they become more aware of their own suffering. Uh, then cultivating equanimity towards all beings to recognize that their own suffering is no different from that of other beings. Uh, then cultivating affection and empathy, uh, recognizing basically the idea of interdependence, uh, even though, again, it's not taught in terms of Buddhist philosophy, but it's really the idea that uh, is conveyed and then uh, cultivating a sense of wishing and aspiring compassion and hopefully by the end, active compassion. So again, it's very uh, ambitious to teach all of these things in only eight weeks and we're very aware of that, but it's just a first attempt to see uh, what people can get from that and if there's already any changes in their brains after this. And then the third group that does uh, only health discussions uh, talks about um, the effects of uh, lifestyle on health. So they learn how to improve their diet, how to do physical exercise, they have group discussions, but they don't do any meditation. So um, the study has many components because uh, my collaborators are looking also at health effects, but the part that I was involved with was brain imaging. And in particular, I was interested not so much in when these people were trying to meditate, uh, but really how they would respond to emotional situations as they would in their everyday life. So could we see changes in how their brain responded to emotional challenge, even when they were not uh, particularly meditating at that time? Um, so what we did is show them images while they were lying inside the MR scanner, and uh, images with different types of emotional content. Uh, some could be positive, like a group of happy people, having a good time, looking happy. Some negative, the people who obviously were suffering from one way or another, uh, and also neutral images. And looking at how the brain responded to each category of images like that. And in particular, we were interested in a brain area called the amygdala. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the amygdala is involved with uh, emotions, and there's a change in response in the amygdala after uh, meditation training, like Richie Davidson found, and there are also anatomical changes in amygdala size after eight weeks of MBSR. So it suggests that something special is happening in that region of the brain after meditation training. Uh, so the question was, do these changes uh, in activation of the amygdala, uh, are they also visible when people were not meditating, when they were just watching these images? So uh, here's a brief uh, summary of our findings. Uh, I'm showing just the two groups that did meditation practice, the mindful attention training, that is the Shine group, and the compassion training, uh, that was the Lojong group. And the top uh, row is uh, their brain response in the amygdala in response to uh, these emotional images of three types. So the negative images are shown in red, the positive are shown in green, and the neutral are shown in gray. And in each graph you see on the left is before they did this training. 
and on the right is after they've completed the eight-week training in either Chine or Lojong. And what you can see in the left uh, one, the Chine group, is that there's an overall decrease in amygdala response to all three types of images which should suggest that people were less emotionally reactive overall, uh, that perhaps they had more equanimity, that they were less disturbed by either positive or negative emotions, perhaps. Whereas in the Lojong group, interestingly, there was also a decrease in the amygdala response to neutral and positive emotions, but in the case of negative images, which were images of people suffering, instead there was an increase in amygdala response. And if you remember uh, from the earlier slide, Richie Davidson also found increased amygdala response during a state of non-referential compassion, uh, which seems to indicate that in that particular case, after this training, people were actually more responsive to watching other people suffering. Now, uh, at that point, uh, you could say, well, is that a good thing? <laughs> Maybe they're more distressed. Maybe they feel uh, depressed or anxious about these other people suffering, and that's not truly compassion. And it's true, at this point, we don't know. But one thing that we did look at was um, how they fared on the score of depression a standard measure uh, used in, uh, in neuroscience and psychology. And what we found is that the people who did the training in Lojong actually experienced a decrease in depression score. So these people, in a way, became happier after they did this eight-week training in Lojong, whereas the group that practiced Chine showed no difference in depression score in that group. So again, uh, we can't make broad conclusions at this point because that was just one study with a small number of participants, only 12 people in each group. But it suggests that there are different things happening with these two different types of training, Shine and Nojong, and that these can uh, have different effects in the brain after even only eight weeks of practice. So, um, uh, one final uh, point was that Interestingly, the people who practiced more also had more of an effect in the brain in terms of increased amygdala response. So it seems like if you do it more, you get more results. But again, it's only a small number of subjects, so we can't make any strong scientific conclusion from this, but this is in line with what the tradition would say. So, um, yeah, to conclude, uh, we did find changes in brain activation after only eight weeks of training in Chine and in Lojong, and these changes were different in both groups. Um, and people also reported feeling less depressed after doing Lojong practices. So uh, this, there is much, much more to study. This is really the beginning of this field. There's many other groups working on these questions, and so this is a really exciting time for this type of research. Um, so that's it for today, but like I said, uh, we will be talking much more about these topics on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday for those of you who are here. Thank you very much. Adi <laughs> Anzo 
authentic lojong kola soba kita kanji thala mandavi go ninga to kita ji so ding ri le ya she da ge kanji ge imba ye na seng nang lo le kanji ge thana ri da ni dunga ji kanji ji kang e che chong kanji ji na te se ya kita thala mo bo che ro wa ti in zaba da ta dang kanji han zu lo ji ta ka hi ri le ya da chen ri da da na rab ki tang ji nang chu ki yo ni shi bi kita ka nga se ri ge pen se ge dalam di de han zu ta wa sa dong go zu ye re ti in zaba da go zu wa in zaba da ta Siri begi muni tang anzo gi ji shingu begi ya ji di tse shimba tang indi gumundu anzo so di gi rila ya kanga di setu gumundu ta tili gi be letsa gi di so <hesitation> anzo letsa gi ta kangi gi kosho gi toni anzo gi tili ta ji ji ni kangi ni tu gumundu la kangi ta ta ji gi lam tu gi yore di in zama la ta di na ni ta ji gi lam tili ya ta kangi kondu nya ni shi sa gi sem tu di ya tili ya sem di so ta so ni kangi gi sem di shiwa ni ba ji ta sem di ba ji <hesitation> nga so gi che di ta ta lam ra ma bo ji ta lo ji ta ka gi di tu gi roa. Ti ni zamba la ti na lo la ta ngan ji ngan ji ngan zo da <hesitation> ji shan ni ji da ten ba ni ya da ta ngan ji mi mi ni ji la lo jang la so ba gon ni ta ji ti la ni ngan zo ta ngan ji <hesitation> so ti ngi ri la ya na lo ki ta sen ki tana zo ma ji ja ti ya ki ti ki ta ti ba ji da ti ma yin pi ki ta ngan zo ki ti ri ki ti ri ki la ni ta ji ta ngan sen du ngi se ya ki ji se ji ro wa ti ni du ra yin na ta ngan ji ngan ji ji la ya da ti ri pi ki ti ngan mu zo ji ti ki ri se. So the um, question is that uh, when we talk about uh, mind uh, or the consciousness, uh, from Buddhist point of view, uh, we talk about uh, uh, something other than the brain and the activities of the brain. Uh, but from the neuroscience point of view, we talk about when we talk about consciousness, it is something to do with the uh, neurons that uh, we find in our brain. And, and um, from scientific um, uh, discoveries and inventions, we have managed to uh, de- uh, to have a lot of um, uh, um, developments in terms of material. Uh, and now um, they think that um, uh, by uh, measuring the brain and um, changing the brain uh, through uh, uh, this kind of uh, um, Uh, programs that you have uh, talked about, uh, they think that uh, uh, they can reduce the uh, problems associated with uh, 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 disturbance of the mind. Uh, and um, uh, um, so the question is that uh, when you talk about uh, uh, um, uh, 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 eliminating the problems or creating happiness uh, for uh, oneself and others, Um, uh, which one of the whether it's science or the uh, this uh, um, the other uh, methods that you have talked about like lojong and um, they are more successful in terms of uh, creating happiness for oneself and others and um, uh, how you see about that the need of simple logic yeah Yeah. Which one? Science or the... goes back to this question of different types of suffering. Um, like, like we already said yesterday and today, the suffering of <coughs> suffering and the suffering of change maybe uh, uh, have been addressed by science, uh, not necessarily successfully completely, but at least there's a lot of, um, you know, um, of findings that have been helpful with that. Uh, in particular, like um, in neuroscience, you know, reducing physical pain. There's a lot of efforts with that, and it's there's a lot of successful treatments. <coughs> But of course, the, the the suffering of conditioned existence, uh, that's not something that scientists have ever even thought about. And so if you think about that type of suffering, science has not offered anything for that, for that and has not even asked itself about it. So... Um, So that's uh, that's one that's one thing. I think uh, that's why I think it's interesting to 
um, have collaborations between these two uh, methods or these two traditions, uh, modern science and the contemplative practices, because they're complementary in a way. Uh, now to the, the greater question about uh, does studying the brain really tell us anything about the mind? Uh, that's, uh, that's a big question. Uh, maybe I'll let karma translate so far and then I can give a few thoughts on that. Um. Uh Dinini <laughs> Dilejo <laughs> So uh, here's, here's what I think about that. Um, I don't know if the mind uh, can be reduced to the material substrate of the brain or if it's non-material. I really don't know. But all I can say is there is a lot of scientific evidence that the mind does have correspondence in the brain. Uh, it may not be it. Maybe it's just like a, you know another copy of it or whatever you want to see it. But uh, there is a link. Uh, if you damage the brain, that damages the mind, and if, and, and even vice versa. So um, I think that's enough of a starting point uh, for us to think that if we investigate how the brain works, that can tell us at least some interesting things about the mind. Maybe not the whole story, and that's okay, but already a lot. So, um, and we can discuss that uh, again in the next few days, because that's a big question. Any <laughs> 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 <laughs>